give us, to start then, just an update on where you've been physically, where your treatments have been at, what's okay. happening there. So at this, on this day, apparently, Facebook showed that there was a post yeah. today where I was in Kingston having the stem cell transplant, and I was pointing, we were taking a walk, I got like a little leave, because my counts were decent, and I got to go outside and I was pointing at the one tulip that was growing in all of Kingston, mm -hmm. like, there it is. So that was a year ago today. And then for six months, um, I was not on any chemo, and, and I just loved the summer, it was so great. Oh, it was beautiful. And then I relapsed, then multiple myeloma, I have, a, I have a, an aggressive form of it, so. It, uh, it reared its ugly head in October. And so then in November, I started on some more chemo. And I didn't have any adverse reactions to it. So physically, I was able to continue working part-time at school, which was so fun. And um, then, and right now, I'm in another relapse. Like the, the multiple myeloma doesn't, he isn't really listening to the drugs right now. So we're gonna mix the drugs up and hit back, we're working on that right now. Did you catch that? She said, I get to teach at school and it's so fun. Did you catch that? <laughs> Talk to me about that. What about school or how fun? Is, how <laughs> has that been different? If I, we sat up here four years ago and I said, oh, so how's teaching school? Oh yeah. See, I get to talk about Christian worldview all the time. I get to talk about God in my, in my work. And so when Marvin and I come home and we talk about what's it like at work, we, we live in two different worlds, really, when it comes to work. Um, I love, love, love my work. But now, sometimes I'll come into school and I'm just watching kids, and we do this thing in the library where everybody's reading, and I know I'm supposed to be filling out paperwork and, and saying how many pages have you read and all that stuff. And really, I just, I'm looking at these kids and just loving them and loving God and thinking, what a gift this is. Look at these awesome people. <laughs> I get myself all sidetracked. <laughs> but I'm still a good teacher. <laughs> if you need any other argument about why you should send your kids to Christian school than that, I don't know. Yeah. Can you put a price on that? I can't. So, we met this week. We did. We talked about the things that you said, there's a couple of questions that I've been asking yeah. the last few months. What are those questions? What has God been showing you? Um, I would say one of the biggest questions when, um, when you are, have death kind of looking at you, I've just had a conversation as we walked in with um, my friends back there that we see each other and shake the same hands all the time. And uh, she said, uh, you know, I've buried two husbands but I know where they are. I can't wait to, to go and see them. Um, she says, when we're older, we think about these things. Well, I'm not older, but I'm thinking about these things a lot. Um, so when something like a, this, this death thing comes up closer than you expected, and you have no choice but to look at it, um, it changes the way that you think. I went into a panic, I, I would say, and I still do sometimes. How do, you, how, do you, how do you die well? How do you be a, how do you be a Christian woman dying? How do I be a dying wife? That's an awful thing to think about, isn't it? How do you do that well? Because I want to do it right, but I, like, how do I be a dying mom? You know, <laughs> what a strange question. But that is the question that I was asking myself. So then, of course, I try to search the word of God, and I'm trying to pray, and I'm trying to figure out what's the right way to go about dying. Well, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. It's horrible. There is no right way to go about it. It's just, you, I don't think that there is a right way to go about it at all. Do you know that sometimes I imagined myself like this? That I'm sitting on Jesus' lap, and I'm one of those kids having a temper tantrum, you know, you know when the kids have the temper tantrum and they're banging on you and banging on you and they, they hit their head, you hit the head right here and, ah, you know, they're freaking out on you. Why is this happening? Ah, you don't even make any sense. That's what I feel like sometimes as I'm on the lap of Jesus and he's got his arms around me, but I'm flailing in there saying, what's going on? 
so the first question they've been asking is how do you die well? The answer you're coming to is it's crazy. There is no way to die well. And even as you're saying it, the reality is that God hates death. We weren't designed for death. So there's no roadmap in how we go through that. And I often, when I talk with those who are grieving as well, is, you know, people have expectations about how they're going to grieve or how you should grieve or shouldn't grieve. And yeah, there are healthy ways to deal with things and there are destructive things you can do. But at the end of the day, it's just walking day by day through that journey. That's exactly what, that's exactly what ended up happening was that, um, you know how when your kid, when the child has stopped their temper tantrum and they're exhausted mm -hmm. and then you get your arms around them finally and by that time they're almost asleep, <laughs> you'll find this out. <laughs> Your love hasn't changed. You're just so relieved that finally they can settle into your arms. Christ's love for me has never changed, but now I'm settling into his arms. Oh, it's such a good spot to be. I don't want to be anywhere else. <laughs> it's beautiful. Marvin, how are your temper tantrums? <laughs> um... Not bad, I, I don't know that I'm in. Bigger question, What's, what has God been teaching you in the journey? What are you seeing or experiencing here? Uh, the bigger picture, the biggest thing probably is no longer look at the long term. Um, and, and, you know, we talked about it probably many times uh, since Betty Ann was diagnosed that, you know, and I was still traveling to work and stuff like that was, uh, you know, I could get... I could have a car accident today, and it could be over for me. So I think um, probably the reality that we have to look at death uh, between the two of us is that, you know, all of us should be because in reality, we don't know what's going to happen to us. I mean, we've, in, yep. in, in that way, it's kind of been a blessing for us to have whatever time we have to focus on it and to understand, you know, what's important in life, what matters 100 years from now. Um, doesn't matter what car I drive, what house I live in. That stuff doesn't isn't going to matter in a hundred years. So that's that's probably been my focus or the biggest change. So a, a kind of a focus or adjustment about priorities and what's really important. Yeah. And what are the things that two or three things that have come out of there that you would say these are the important things as I see it. <laughs> Hold the mic nice and close. Uh, okay. Um, uh, my faith, um, our, our, our family, and, and whatever we can do for the future to, um, to help my kids along in their faith walk. And that, um, I think that's the biggest, the biggest important thing. Um, uh, we don't make long-term plans anymore. We just don't. Um, and actually, it's not that bad not to make long-term <laughs> plans. It's kind of fun. <laughs> Yeah, um, no retirement plans. Um, you know, the farthest we're looking out, we're, we're planning to go out west this summer, and we're hoping with Betty Ann's situation we can do that, and after that, I have no clue. But it doesn't matter. <laughs> Something will happen. Yeah. Uh, I know what the gifts you are giving to this congregation right now. I've seen it because I've talked with you individually, but for them to see too is like, is this not a beautiful couple? Is God uh, <laughs> done wonderful, right? What well, God is showing you this morning, every person here is a gift. It's a gift and it's an opportunity for you to go. I was serious when I asked that opening question. Imagine, go home today, go for a walk with your loved ones, with a friend. Say, how would I change my life? How would our priorities change if we knew that we only had a limited amount of time. And the reality articulated by Marvin so eloquently is absolutely true. Betty Ann will probably not be the next person sitting in this room to die. That means someone else here will be. That means the reality of it is that many, some people sitting here are facing that reality without knowing it. Second thing that you question you asked 
was what do we fear about death? Mm -hmm. I knew that your sermon series was about um, fear. And I thought, okay, so what is it that we're afraid of when we come to, to think about death? And I think there's a couple of things. Uh, one of them is the fact that we do it all alone. We come to the Father. Like Marvin's not going to be there when I meet Jesus. He's not going to be right beside me. I can't kind of, we can't have a tandem conversation, you know. I can't take John, who's got all the right words with me, um, to talk to Jesus on my behalf. I can't do any of that. It's just me. I remember being at Alpha years and years ago. And there was a gentleman in my group, and we were asked the question, when we come and meet Jesus face to face, what do you think he will say or, or, or do? What do you think he will ask us? And this, this gentleman said, I think he's going to ask, what have you done for me? And my heart just sunk at that answer. Because in my heart, I think that the first thing he's going to do, he's going to look at us and he's going to say, Finally, I love you. Come over here and let me give you that hug. <laughs> like it, the love that God has for us trumps all of that. And it was shown in Jesus. It's not about what I do. It's about what he has already done. So I cling to that hope with both hands and both feet, if I can, that he is taking me right into heaven with him, that he has paid for my sin. He's not going to ask me, what have you done? He already knows what I've done. And I've confessed it, and he has forgiven me. So I get to just take the ride. <laughs> you guys, it's going to be so cool. I'm so, I'm so happy about it. I'm so happy about being saved by grace. Praise Jesus. What we read, there's a man who showed up at the wedding banquet, and Jesus looked at him, said, you ain't got the right clothes on. What are you doing? And what we need to understand about the wedding feast that would happen in that day is that not only would the person who throw the banquet, throw the food, have the wine, but they would send the clothes to your house. They would give you the wedding clothes that you should wear. They would dress you. So when Jesus Christ says, I've invited you to my wedding banquet, what he's saying is, I've not only invited you to the feast, but I've given you the clothes. I've given you the outfit. And the outfit you wear isn't the condemnation that you feel, but the outfit you wear is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now, if you don't have that assurance, if you're sitting here today and you're thinking, I don't really know that I love Jesus. I don't really know that I've accepted him as my Lord and Savior and that I've come to understand that spiritual reality. It's available to anyone. You see, the story says that a lot of the people that thought they would end up at the banquet and should have been there didn't end up going because they got distracted. They got distracted in their 401Ks and their cars and their houses and everything else. And they forgot about the important reality of life that one day we will all meet Jesus face to face. And Jesus loves us so much that not only does he invite us to the wedding banquet, but he gives us the wedding clothes. Yeah. Do you know that the, the definitely that... When I wake up every morning and I recognize there's this lump, right? And that's the fear of, of the unknown, the fear of, of death. It's still there. Um, I, could, I tell you with all the joy in my heart that I know I have hope. I trust him. I trust him because he has not failed before. But I do live in this, uh, with this question mark that's in front of me about what it's going to feel like. I tell you the truth, I'm very afraid of pain. I haven't had any pain, um, so I, I, I'm afraid of pain, for sure. I don't know what that's going to look like, but if I let my mind go there too much, right, then I'm not living right now. And, and living now is so good. It's so beautiful. 
Like, look at spring right now. Isn't it incredible? You know, the other day I came home and I was, there's this bush that was blooming all, all white flowers and I used to think, oh yeah, that's awesome, that's beautiful, because I always really like creation. But I actually started laughing out loud because it's just so beautiful. Like, I'm seeing things with such clarity now, almost as if he's granting me his view of his creation and saying, look what I can do, look what I can do, look what I've done. And I'm just so thankful. And that takes your fear away. If you're afraid, you have to, um, we have a will. And so we have to choose to focus not on the fear, but on the thankfulness and on the grace and, and just say his name even. Just saying his name, saying Jesus will give us Oh, such, such hope, and then the fear subsides. But I don't want you to think that, oh yeah, you know, I've got it all together, and I'm just, no fear. No, it's there still, but every day and time and time again, every time it comes up, then I've got tools, and I've got the great I am on my side to help me go right up against that fear and say, yeah, you don't actually exist, you don't actually matter, because he beat death. He beat you. Get behind me, Satan. Whatever you need to do and say, death is no longer. It, it, has, uh, it has no sting. We met and talked. You have kind of touched on it, but you've said at times when uh, I can find that there's an ebb and flow, that if something happens for a few days, I start getting more filled with fear. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, if, I, if I don't read the scriptures every single day, if I don't spend all kinds of time talking to God all the time, like I walk around talking to him all the time, and I, can, I know that if I get really distracted, like around report card writing time or whatever, yeah, other times when there's things that come up and they become like your priority, and I'm talking to him less, I am more fearful. I am more anxious. I start Googling new drugs for multiple myeloma. I start going down that road again, that fear road. It's, it's, I have to turn my eyes on Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in light of his glory and grace. Um, I like that song. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I like that song. It's very, very true that it centers, it centers. Okay, oh, what really matters? It's you, it's you and me. But there's a line in there that says, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. Um, I get why that line is there. It's comparing to God's glory and grace, but the things of this world have not grown strangely dim for me. <laughs> I see things with such clarity. And such beauty. Oh my goodness. So I walk into church today and there's Caleb. Caleb Winklehorst has really grown. <laughs> so I'm looking at Caleb and I was like, that's marvelous. That's incredible. <laughs> like I'm looking at him with a little more clarity. You know, yeah. I'm looking at this baby. This is a gorgeous baby. And a whole life ahead of her. There's more joy in that clarity than there is, in, than there is pain. I can't even explain it. It's crazy awesome. <laughs> Marvin. Uh, so I'll just share it. I want to hear from you what impact it's had because Marvin and I have been accountability buddies and so we're actually on the Bible app together. So Marvin is on day 119 or 120 is today, I think. Marvin's on track. I'm at about day 102. So I got about 18 days of catching up to do. So Marvin is established and built into your life as well, the regular discipline of reading and reflecting on scripture. How is that helping you? Uh, so many days um, I read what I need that day. And um, sometimes even just the daily Bible verse just really fits in. And um, yeah, but you know, this, this journey we're on, um, if you look, if you read through the Bible and you re it's not new. It's, you know, um, nobody that's in the Bible is still alive, uh, even Lazarus. And, you know, that struck me one day. Yeah, we'd love for a miracle. Yeah. Betty Ann and I could retire together old people, but that's probably not going to happen. Wow. And, um, and as, you, as you read through it, you just, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's the words that I need for today. Almost every day there's something 
it just fits. So, um, yeah, it's, I've been doing it for three or four years now, and uh, it's definitely, definitely been a good thing for me. The one scripture that has become very significant to you. There's so many passages that are unbelievable. I really love the Psalms. Psalm, the, a lot of the Psalms of David talk about um, how he throws himself on the mercy of God, and he says, he says, I'm going to tell of your glorious deeds. Do this, Lord, like be with me, and I will tell of all of your glorious deeds. Well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep talking about God's glorious deeds till the day I die. Because I think that's what we're here for. I think that's what we're made to do, is live in community with God, or in, com yeah, in commun communion with God, with each other. And he is glorified when we go like this together and we tell the stories of what God's doing in our lives. It lifts ourselves, each other up. What, that's glorifying to God. It's our purpose. That's the point. <laughs> do it. Do it often. <laughs> But there's, a, there's many passages, but um, Psalm 23 is often read at funerals, and for good reason. It has a lot of comfort for the people that are left behind. But it provides so much comfort for somebody that is in my shoes, for someone like ourselves. And if you were in Bradenton in Florida, then I talked a little bit about this, and I just want to express it to everybody here at Rehoboth, too. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. <laughs> he makes me lie down green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me along paths of righteousness. He shows me which directions to take. Right? And why? For his name's sake. Not for me. Not to cure me. Not to heal this, this, this cancer. Not for any other reason except for his name's sake because he is the point. He is to be glorified. He, restore, he refreshes my soul and guides me in these paths of righteousness for his name's sake. But I get blessed in the meantime. We all get blessed in the meantime. <laughs> okay. For his name's sake. Now, this next piece. Even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Like, I can't see the future, right? It's obscured. I'm in this valley. I can't see. It's dark, right? And then there's this shadow that's always hanging over me. And it's an awful thing, yes. But I'm in the shadow of death. I fear nothing. I fear nothing. I am not afraid. <laughs> because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they just comfort me. Now get this. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My enemy right now is multiple myeloma. That cancer is sitting in the room. It's not gone. It's my enemy and it's sitting right there. But what does God do? He prepares a table before me. It's like in your face. Mm. I'm at the table, and cancer's not invited, but he's there in the room. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and then right in front of it, while cancer is doing what it does in my body, he anoints my head with oil, and my cup is overflowing. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of this life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <laughs> Will you close in prayer for us, Marvin? Father in heaven, thank you for this day. Thank you for this church service, Lord. Thank you that we could be up here. We could, we could uh, share our story, Lord. But thank you for the gifts that you give us every day and every day that we, we live, Lord. And, um, you know, you're with us every day, no matter what happens. You're walking with us. And, uh, Lord, I pray that we can, we can actually be just 
in this moment, in this day, Lord, and worship you. We thank you for all your blessings. In your name we pray, amen.